far on my professional background and the photo that's the background to this slide. Um, this is at Kankakee Sands up in Northwest Indiana in Newton County. Um, I can't see everyone, but raise your hand if you've been to Kankakee Sands. Raise your hand if you would like to go to Kankakee Sands. <laughs> there you go. Okay. It's a really, really amazing part of Indiana. It's a nearly 7,000 acre prairie wetland and savanna restoration. And there are some remnant preserves there. And uh, bison have been reintroduced to the site and are now shaping the plant and animal communities. And it's also the only place in Indiana where the regal fritillary, this uh, prairie butterfly exists. And I was really blessed to work there for 11 years, collecting and producing seeds to plant and create that habitat. And it's a place where my educational background in agronomy and botany from Purdue and my interest in conservation were really able to come together. I've, I've been with the Xerces Society since 2018, and I am based out of a home office in Warren County, west of West Lafayette. I worked from home even before the pandemic. I was kind of pre-adapted. Um, the Xerces Society is an international conservation organization focused on invertebrates and their habitats. We were formed in 1971 by Dr. Robert Michael Pyle uh, as an organization of butterfly scientists. We are named for the butterfly that's pictured here, the, the now extinct Xerces blue. It was the first butterfly to be lost to extinction in the U.S. due to human activity through habitat destruction. And so Xerces was initially formed by concerned people who wanted to work to prevent the extinction of other butterfly species. And in that 50 year history, we've grown and now we have over 50 staff in more than 17 states. And um, 10 of those staff are partner biologists with NRCS and they support planning and implementation of farm bill programs. Um, that's what a lot of our Midwest folks do. We have several program areas, including pollinator conservation and habitat work, uh, promoting agricultural biodiversity, endangered species, such as certain bumblebee, butterfly, and freshwater mussel species. We also have a pesticide team who helps us to understand and apply research in order to reduce the use and detrimental effects of pesticides. And we have programs in urban conservation, um, we use restoration, research, education, outreach, and advocacy to further our conservation mission. In addition to our work on the ground, we have a really large and rich publications library. Items in our library are available online as free PDF downloads. And um, among the resources in our library are recommended plant lists, guides to assess um, creating pollinator or beneficial insect habitat and other um, related handbooks. Oops. Okay. Um, also getting started here, I just wanted to, to thank both Brooke and Nancy. Nancy and I, I think have been emailing about this for more than a year, but it's happening. So thank you for the invitation. And I also want to, to say thank you to Xerces supporters. Uh, we're a nonprofit, so we have individual members, and we're also funded by um, companies, foundations, and, and other agencies who make our work possible. Okay, um, next, I have to say, I am not a deceptive person. I'm just, I'm not, I'm not a deceptive person. I think most of us are, are not. But um, now that we've done the introduction acknowledgements, I have to come clean to you. I was a little deceptive um, with this title and this idea of good bug, bad bug. Um, so the spoiler about how I was deceptive is that there isn't always a good bug or a bad bug. It's, it's all relative and it's all based on sort of our preferences or priorities or judgments. And, and that's what I wanna get into some uh, tonight. And that's why I use that title to get us thinking about how we think about insects. We tend to put them in these categories of, of good or bad. 
Um, and I'll, I'll just note, so I've kind of copied, I was working on a couple presentations this week and I used this nice artwork several times. And my house is full of the, the Asian lady beetles right now. Maybe some of you are also having that experience, but here was a little um, beetle that came to walk across my computer screen today and say hi to all of its cousins there, I think. Okay, this is from some of your poll responses about the question of invertebrates that you'd like to see more of. So you mentioned butterflies or moths, and of course, you know, caterpillars are the younger life stages of those. Bees, wasps, um, ladybugs, also known as lady beetles, spiders, lacewings, monarchs, mantids, dragonflies, and fireflies. And these are listed in, in no particular order, just sort of um, summarizing things here. And it's also not everything, but just in a general sense, these were what, what was listed. On the other side, invertebrates that you'd like to see less of are aphids, mosquitoes, bagworms, Japanese beetles, and pesky gnats, root borers, grubs, flea beetles, sap sucking insects, and potato bugs. And then I, I added slugs. You know, often um, slugs are something that either gardeners or farmers contend with, um, but I don't think that was, that was mentioned on, on any of your responses, interestingly enough. All right, into, into invertebrates a bit more. This is a, a, a pie chart that just shows the diversity of species on Earth. And currently we're at around 2.1 million described species on Earth. Um, I don't think this in, includes the, the microbes, but fungi, plants, invertebrates, invertebrates. And if you look at um, this pie chart, more than about 70% of all of those are invertebrates. And in the animal kingdom, 95% um, of the species are invertebrate. So certainly a hugely diverse and varied um, group. And um, this slide, I think, also tries to help us picture and, and get into our, our heads um, kind of how we might relate to insects and some of the ecosystem services that they provide. So in the soil, they're important in nutrient cycling and decomposition. They also are naturally, they need to eat too. And, and we can see that sometimes is that they're offering free pest control services for us. Um, insects can turn plants into food for other animals. So for example, this, this bluebird here holding a caterpillar, you know, depending on the bird species, they can eat seeds or other things as adults, but to raise, chicks really requires protein, which requires insects. So caterpillars and other bugs are um, important for all of our, our birds and vertebrate wildlife. And then of course, they're important for, for plants. They've got this long-standing dependence and relationship on um, pollinators and, and plants and how plants can produce seeds. But um, as with many parts of the natural world, insects are, are faced with several threats that are causing decline. And just to categorize these loosely or broadly, it's habitat loss, um, pesticides, disease and non-native species, and climate change. And to kind of condense things here at the bottom of each arrow, you know, I've, I've listed what some of the solutions or mitigations can be for that. So conserving and creating habitat, reducing our reliance on pesticides, reducing the risks um, from managed pollinator species. Some of those um, like the European honeybee are non-native because they're managed, they also are more likely to become sick and they can spread disease to wild bee populations. And then for navigating an uncertain climate in the future, you just incorporate more species and habitat diversity as a way to address that. Okay, I'm gonna just go a little bit more into insect biology here. Um, 
these are the, the six main groups of insect or invertebrate pollinators. So butterflies, moths, flies, and um, beetles. Get this thing through here. Uh, wasps here in the lower middle, and then bees. And um, this photo here is also a fly, but this is showing the, the larva of a fly feeding on an aphid. So the, the young fly is a predatory carnivorous insect, but the adult fly is feeding on, on pollen or nectar of flowers. And here's another pie chart that is just showing the diversity of our bees in North America. There are more than 4,000 bee species in North America, and this chart shows the main groups of our wild native bees. If you look at the sliver of the pie that represents bumblebees and the European honeybee, um, circled there in, in red, um, these are probably the types of bees that people are most familiar with. They're just one managed species and around 49 species of bumblebees, and yet that's only one tenth of a percent of all this bee diversity that's in North America. Um, and in Indiana, we have several hundreds of, of bee species. If, if you're not familiar with this yet, um, I like to, to cover this because it helps us think about how, how the plants and the habitat we create is, are, is going to relate to these native bees. So there's three main types of nesting behavior. That's the way that um, bees are, are grouped. So bumblebees, which are only about 1% of native bees, they, they nest in cavities and they kind of have these pot-shaped cells pictured on the left. The stem or, or tunnel nesting bees on the top are about 30% of our native bees and around 70% are ground nesting bees. They use tunnels in, in the soil for their nests. Looking more at those ground nesting bees, um, they can kind of resemble ant nests, especially above ground. They're, they're little entries with loose soil around them. And there you can see the system of tunnels and chambers where the young bee is with bee bread, which is a package of pollen and nectar that its mother bee has collected from flowers and put there for it to feed on after it hatches from the egg. Um, and so they, the bees excavate this. Um, they need looser kind of lighter soils like sandy or loamy soils, but some are able to nest in clay also. So these are solitary bees. There's not a colony and group effort like in honeybees. This one mother is going out and bringing food back to all of her um, children over the course of their, their season. The, the stem or tunnel nesting bees, again, about 30% of our native bees, they'll use the, the pithy hollow centers of some of um, the woody species or grasses and even some forbs have this. And then they make partitions between each egg. They also put a little package of food in there for the larva to eat when it hatches. And sometimes those partitions are made out of mud um, or leaf pieces. So that's another way that, that plants are important um, is as nest material. And then uh, bumblebees, these are, are slightly social. Um, it'll just be one female who will have mated in the fall. The males die in the fall and those mated females overwinter in loose leaf litter. And then when they wake up in the spring, they begin searching for a site to start a nest. And then they, they lay eggs and raise the first generation. And then the second generation that summer will help raise um, their subsequent siblings. Um, so there's a cute little picture of baby bumblebees and these Bumblebees use cavities. So sometimes um, this is a hollow place in a tree near the ground or also rock piles um, are places where they'll use them. Sometimes abandoned rodent burrows are, are also common places for bumblebee nests. And then we wanna talk a little bit about the diversity of not just pollinators, but also of of beneficial insects. They're also known as natural enemies. They can perform, again, um, ecosystem services, cycling nutrients, managing pests, um, 
And so there's a variety of beetles, wasps, um, flies, and, and their larvae shown here. And then there's um, a third group of, not really a group, but an, another region where insects live that we don't see them very much. And this is in or right on the soil. And I just am putting that out there as another place to be thinking of, of where insects are. Um, Xerxes has been working on a project to develop this really beautiful handbook with 77 profiles of soil invertebrate groups. And that's going to be coming out in a few months. And we're having a series of online courses about this content as well. OK, so if you look at the habitat side then, uh, what is pollinator habitat? There's four general components, of course. First, there's the food sources, nectar and pollen, all throughout the, the period when bees are active and not overwintering. Also, shelter. They need sites, depending on, on what their nesting behavior is, and protection from disease and competition from managed bees. As with any wildlife, connectivity is important. And then also um, pesticides, especially insecticides, are intended to kill insects. So being protected from pesticides or pesticide-free areas are also really important um, as pollinator habitat. If we look at the, the food sources, there are what insects or pollinators need in their larval stages, as well as what they need in the adult stages. So if we just talk about the monarch butterfly, Caterpillars need to feed on, on a milkweed species or related, closely related plant, whereas the adult butterflies, they've got a totally different mouth part and they're gonna be drinking nectar from flowers. Um, bees are the same way as you saw. The, the mothers are actively gathering pollen and taking that back to the nest for the developing larva and um, the adult bees themselves are feeding on both pollen and nectar. And then thinking a little more deeply about plants for shelter and nesting habitat. So we need you know, dead litter from previous seasons, hollow stems, areas without plants actually, some undisturbed bare open soil. Uh, grasses should also be thought of as pollinator plants. They don't have um, really the kind of pollen that bees normally seek out because they are wind pollinated rather than insect pollinated, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. And also dead trees and limbs are pollinator friendly plants because those are sites for some of those tunnel nesting species. Um, to think about that a little bit more, so like we said, 30% of our native bees nest in stems or wood cavities. And this, you know, you can probably off the top of your head, as you've been tending to plants in your garden, you become familiar with which ones have hollow stems. Uh, purple coneflower is one, Joe pie weeds are another, um, even tall coreopsis, cup plant. Uh, there's many, many that fit this category. So rather than just thinking of them maybe as the flowers and the leaves, think also about the value of those those stems over the winter period. So leave at least some of the stalks intact and cut them at a variety of height. And now you've got like, not a bird feeder to watch for birds, but a potential nest site to, to watch for the solitary bee activity. And then also I just wanted to touch on lawns and the value of lawns as pollinator habitat. There's kind of two ways to look at this. You can still have um, very short vegetation, but rather than being a monoculture of turf, you can let things like clover or violets, um, some of the little weedy mints that grow in lawns, just accept those and enjoy them for the, the value that they bring to the, the little insects in your yard. And you can also work to convert turf to something like a seeded meadow or just converting it into more flower beds. Um, this panel is from a publication I worked on with a landscape architect where we were just trying to provide guidance for 
businesses or companies that would normally install turf and showing them some of the, this shows the, the cost advantages over the lifetime of a project of lawn compared to a meadow. And of course, there's all kinds of ecological and aesthetic benefits to that as well. Um, this is a, a nice little pamphlet of Xerxes with beautiful artwork, but it's showing what I talked about before. So you've got this um, female honeybee who's mated um, in the fall and spent the winter hunkered down and she emerges in the spring and finds a new nest site and begins raising the young there, uh, depending on all the different flowers with their pollen and nectar throughout the year. And then that cycle repeats into the next season. And you know, it's, it's mentioned here that leave leaf litter, downed wood, and uncut bunch grasses to serve as potential overwintering sites. So again, that's my, my point about how or why grasses are pollinator friendly as well. It's really that litter that can provide some of the cover and protection, either for nest sites in some cases or for overwintering. And again, I mean, pollinator habitat, oftentimes it's the same as natural enemies or, or um, natural pest control. Those same insects also do really well in, in pollinator habitat. They're not necessarily different from one another or exclusive. Um, they're all interacting. And like I said, many of the, the natural enemies that might be predators as larvae as adults, they'll feed on pollen. Nectar. Okay, I know there were, um, for some of the, the new folks here, uh, just what plants to start with, which native plants to start with. And this is, I'm sure, too small to read, but um, I've sent Brooke a list of resources. So this is one of our online guides that you can uh, access and download to print. But for those Midwestern states, um, it shows just a, a nice basic I and mean, this is even beyond basic. You actually, you can have a, a pollinator garden with one plant. That's all you need to get started. But this shows a range of species, which seasons they are flowering in. And then there's also a few shrubs and trees listed there as well. But as, as a general rule, you wanna try to have diversity of, um, of species. And so one way to do that is just look at getting different flowering plant families, and then also have different shapes of flowers, different colors, and different seasons of the year. So if I were going to tell you like the four or five plants, something like golden alexanders, that's in the carrot family, and it blooms very early. And it has like lovely foliage throughout the whole year. And then even once the flowers fade, the seed heads are also they, they persist. Um, it's in, like I said, the carrot family. So they're like little umbrellas that are also interesting all throughout the, the summer, fall, and winter. So that's one golden alexanders in the carrot family. It, it will also be a host plant for swallowtail butterflies. Um, another great one then, of course, would be a milkweed. Um, we've got several species to choose from. Swamp milkweed likes wet soil, but it will also grow in medium moist soil. And it, it's not as aggressive as common milkweed. It doesn't spread by rhizomes. And again, um, monarchs are feeding on the, the monarch larvae are feeding on the plants. And then the flowers feed many, many kinds of, of butterflies and, and bees and other insects. Um, then some things from the aster family. So some of our native sunflowers or something like blazing star and Joe pie weed is wonderful. Um, that one has the hollow stems and just all kinds of bees and butterflies. Love it. And then I didn't include at least one um, bunch grass that can be one of the, the tall grasses like big blue stem or Indian grass. Um, little blue stem is a little bit shorter. And, and prairie drop seed is, is even shorter still. Looking a bit more, um, just narrowing in on monarchs. So of course, 
planting um, milkweeds. These are some of the species that are native to Indiana and that grow well and are easy to get seeds or plants of. Common milkweed, swamp milkweed, butterfly milkweed, world milkweed, and prairie milkweed. You can also refresh them by, by cutting them back and you know they'll re-sprout again. And often the female monarchs prefer those newer, more tender leaves to lay their eggs on. So that's that's one reason to, to feel okay about occasionally you're trimming some of your milkweed stems. And then also um, the adults will need nectar plants throughout the season, so provide those. Um, in addition to protecting that habitat from pesticide use, you can also participate in community science efforts. There's several that track, you know, when monarchs are where, at what life stage, like that site is Journey North. Others are studying some of the diseases that monarchs are facing. And then there are some that tag monarchs and learn more about their migration. Um, also, you can work in your community to build support for monarch and pollinator habitat and limit mowing and contribute to other conservation efforts and groups. I think in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip this. Um, this is another nice milkweed guide for the Midwest. This is prairie milkweed or Sullivan's milkweed, Asclepius sullivantii. Um, I don't have a picture of the flowers here. It, it, it superficially looks very similar to common milkweed, but it's got especially prominent pink veins um, in the middle of each leaf. And then I, I wanted to include this map here to show uh, the counties where it's considered native to. This is from BONAP, which is the Biota of North America program. And um, I, I use that web tool a lot to look at the distribution, the native distribution of plants. The yellow color is, is showing counties where it's more rare. And then uh, Xerces, we have a tool on our website called Milkweed Seed Finder. And you can go there and you can enter in some filters like what species you're looking for, if you're looking for plants or seeds what state you're in, or you can just use the, the map there to browse and that will return back a list of producers or suppliers of milkweed seed. Um, well, we're still talking about milkweeds, of course. Um, there are other milkweed insects, not just monarchs, but one example are the milkweed bugs. They feed on, um, they're one of the sucking insects. So you probably, if you have milkweeds, you've seen them clustered on the fruit pods like this. And they've actually pierced through that with their straw-like mouth parts. And, and they are harming the seeds. Um, you know, they're sucking out the, the embryos and the endosperm of the seeds. So um, it's not good if you're trying to produce a lot of viable seeds, but they otherwise don't really harm milkweed plants. And, you know, there's um, many others like the red milkweed longhorn beetles, caterpillars of the milkweed tussock moth, other stem weevils, um, the swamp milkweed beetle. There's several other insects that have adapted to feed on, on milkweeds. And I know you may be thinking that, that we we're caring for milkweeds because of monarchs, but um, all these other insects are depending on milkweeds too. Okay, we're gonna go back to the poll here and your responses for a little bit and, and look at what you're doing. This was the question, what, have, what kinds of things have you been doing to get more of the, the good bugs or the bugs that you want to see? Having a variety of spring and summer flowering natives and also a few fall ones and not using insecticide or grass fertilizers. Planting both um, nectar and host plants for butterflies and pollinators, leaving the cleanup until spring, no chemicals or lawn spraying, removing the Chinese mantis if found, adding puddle places, you know, or, or parts where there's mud or water and leaving a few logs around for bees. Well, I think like this, this person gets an A plus. All of the sort of habitat things that we've talked about so far, they're they're doing them. Um, 
Those puddle places are, are not so important for water. These insects will get most of the water they need through nectar or their food sources, but puddles are important again for mud for the species that are nesting in tunnels and need a little bit of mud to make those separations in their nest. And another one here, leaving areas of long grass and leaf litter, and that's worked for fireflies. Um, they initially put up a bee house, but um, they found that leaving stems of perennials uncut until springtime, so over the winter, and putting out some logs from dead trees was also more beneficial. They are planting shrubs and evening flowering perennials that certain species of moss like. So um, we have a native that's actually pretty weedy. It's in a lot of, of roadsides or fence rows that aren't mowed. The biennial evening primrose, and, and that's one of those flowers that blooms at night or in the evening. Letting the weeds stray in places, I have areas I don't mow, which encourages native plants and attracts good bugs. All right, very good. Okay, now I'm, I'm flipping here. Um, these are some responses to what you're doing about discouraging the insects you'd like to see less of. So spraying with water that has dish soap in it or spraying with water only, putting nets over the plants. And this person has experienced that the netting's been really beneficial. Not sure um, you know, if the water or dish soap is really killing them or just knocking them off the plants temporarily. Someone else is working to, to garden organically and without any chemicals and just trying to keep plants healthy. And several responses said that they're not doing anything. Um, this is a resource so here. I'm going to try. This is a habitat assessment guide for pollinators in yards, gardens, and parks. And I, I really like this resource. So um, this is our test here. We're going to see. Are you guys seeing me go to the internet here? Not yet. Okay. I might have to change. Which window I'm sharing. Yeah, and I don't have those controls available to me, I think, right now. Oh, wait, oh, there they are. Stop share, screen share, here we go. Okay, how about now? Yes. Yes, okay. So um, this, as an example, I'm just gonna open this quickly so you can see it, but I encourage you all to, to go um, find this for yourself. It just kind of talks through some of the, the background and some of these same concepts that we've talked about. But there's a really nice checklist here of actions you can do to promote pollinators and beneficial insects um, in places like yards, gardens, and parks. So, um, you know, here's one gradually replace perennial and annual landscaping that provides little value to wildlife, like daylilies, hostas, or pansies and replace those with more diverse native wildflower plantings. Um, there's parts here about lawn care. For mowed areas, remove, reduce mowing frequency and increase mowing height, allowing flowering weeds to flourish. There's also some actions you can take in fruit and vegetable gardens, and then things you can do in your community, like using signs to explain this is pollinator habitat and, and why why it looks like it does and what the plants are there for. And then um, this also, as you go through it, there's a set of instructions, but you kind of get walked through these steps for scoring. So the idea is, is maybe, you know, you start wherever you're at and you're working to improve it a little bit. So you first do your before score and then after you've changed some of your uh, practices or which plants you have, you can score yourself again for after. But it has things like just the percent of flowering vegetation that's in the yard or garden, the percent of that which is native. If you've got um, some of these other foraging features, um, 
there are some plants that are considered superfoods and, and those are listed in this as well. So you get extra points for those. Uh, looking at sites for ground nesting bees, looking at sites or plants for the stem and tunnel nesting bees, and then what your pesticide practices are and what's happening in your community. Um, there's some more links on there. And then here's this table of, of superfoods and host plants. So again, this was written for the whole United States. It doesn't go down to individual species because one species might be native in one region, but not native in another. Um, so these are different genera, um, the, just the, the genus name to kind of get you started. And, and there's also a nice list here of plants that we as people can eat, but which also have a value to pollinators. So just, I really like that, that resource and wanted to share it. And is that on your resource okay. guide, Stephanie? Yep, that's on the, the resource guide. Great. Okay. Are we back in the PowerPoint now? We are. Okay, thanks for coming along. Well done. Um, so lady beetles was another um, species that came up that people wanted to see more of. And these are some pages that I've just taken a snapshot of from our Habitat Planning for Beneficial Insects guide. And you can see there's a really nice profile here that just talks about this group and how to recognize them, what they eat, um, what their al alternate prey is, and then what are some conservation strategies for that. Um, and then this picture shows how diverse lady beetles are. And of course, this is again for all of the United States, but it's showing which ones are native to the United States and which ones are, are non-native. Um, so this is also on the, the resource guide and something, no, I'm sorry, this one's not on the resource guide, but if you um, search for Xerces beneficial insects, this guide will, oh, you'll find it. I also linked, um, this is on the resource guide, we have a policy position on the potential risks of releasing native lady beetles. So yeah, a lot of people are trying to reduce their dependence on, on insecticides and instead use insects like these predatory lady beetles to control pest insects. But there's a few main things I just wanna point out that are problematic with that. Um, often lady beetles are either you know, grown in captivity or they're collected from the wild. So when they're grown in captivity and then released, they may have disease um, that then is spread to wild populations or you know, when they're collected from the wild and then sold and shipped, they could be spreading disease from one part of the country to another. And that's also depleting wild populations. And um, lady beetles also, if they're released, their natural response is going to be to disperse. So you may have experienced this where you get them and then you, know, you let them out. And then a few days later, you can't really tell that you released any because they've, they've dispersed out into the landscape. So, you know, it's, it's like a nice idea in theory, but we, we do not recommend purchasing or, or using, these are, this is called augmented biological control where you're adding the insects. Instead, we, we promote conservation biocontrol where you're creating the habitat and the conditions for the insects that would naturally be there to thrive. Um, on one of the other insects, I think this was sometimes on the good list and sometimes on the bad list, um, are the mantids or also known as mantises. And um, I think given some of your answers, a lot of you are aware uh, this is a diverse group as well. And we have many native species in this part of the US, but there's also several introduced non-native species, like the Chinese mantis. And that's by far the most frequently or common one that you'll see is actually the non-native one. And they're just not very affected, effective for targeted pest control. They'll like eat anything. Um, 
And this is kind of going to be a shocking photo next. So just I'm warning you. But um, you know, if, if you have milkweeds and monarchs and you're watching your caterpillars, you may have also seen this as well. Um, mantises will eat caterpillars of any species and any size, and also praying mantises often can actually catch adult monarch butterflies and, and eat them as well. So it's, it's okay, everybody's got to eat, but mantises are, are a group that are not particularly selective. Uh, a beneficial insect or natural predator that is much more specific are parasitoids. So parasitoids are either wasps, I mean wasps are parasitoids and some flies are parasitoids. And their life cycle is that the, the females will lay eggs in the bodies of another insect and then those eggs hatch, the larva develops and feeds internally on that host insect. And um, these, there's very close relationships. It's also su suspected or um, most scientists most entomologists have revealed that every insect also has its partner parasitoid. Um, so it's, you know, eat or be eaten. But there's all these really specific types of wasps and, and flies that are out there. This is showing a leaf that's, you know, heavily infested with aphids. Um, you can see the, the wasp itself, the parasitoid wasp is in the little oval more to the left. So pretty small size, you know, not much bigger than these aphids. And then the other circles are showing aphids, which are now called um, mummies, because essentially they're just shells of them for of their former selves. So those are ones that have been parasitized. Um, the, the young little wasps have grown up inside of them and hatched out. Um, Another insect that folks wanted to see less of were mosquitoes, of course. And, and this can be both because they're just um, annoying in the way that they buzz, they're annoying in that they sting and then your skin itches. And also uh, at a more dangerous level, they can, they can spread disease. So, you know, a lot of um, our recommendations, um, I have this other link here. We have several resources on effective mosquito management. And some of it has to do with what the individual person can do in terms of reducing sources of stagnant water where they'll grow. Um, but there's also guidance for what parks or towns can do to, to kind of manage their mosquito spraying programs so that all the other pollinators or insects that we consider good, that are on our good list, are not negatively impacted um, by, by spring. Sometimes that's just, you know, making sure um, even just if, you're, if your town fogs, they can sometimes just fogging at night after a lot of the other daytime insects have taken cover can help reduce some of those things. So. This is, again, I've got more detail in the, in the other resources, but there's some really nice guidance on that for folks. Okay, Japanese beetles. I think this was also, um, along with aphids and mosquitoes, um, really high on folks' bad list. So here's a, a photo showing an assassin bug. Again, one of the ones that can be a predator with a piercing mouth part who's who's actually come and hunted this Japanese beetle. But yeah, honestly, Japanese beetles are really hard to, um, to deal, or I mean, difficult to try to deal with or reduce. People talked about picking. They also pick um, some of these bad bugs off and maybe drown them. Um, so you can do that. There are hormone or pheromone traps, but I think there's just such a huge amount of Japanese beetles in our landscape. Um, they really like to feed on soybean plants. So since so much of our landscape in Indiana has one of their favorite plants, there's always like an endless supply of Japanese beetles. But you know, you've probably learned which of the plants you've tried that Japanese beetles like. And so one way to avoid Japanese beetles is, is to just not use those plants, but choose other plants in your garden. Um, 
another person responded that that they use plants that like um, the biennial evening primrose. So yes, Japanese beetles will really feed on that, but it's kind of like a trap or a um, place to dry in the Japanese beetles and make it easier for the gardener to pick them off one by one. Um, okay, getting into resources here then and, and towards the end. Um, Xerxes has a YouTube channel and this has really grown during the pandemic because we're doing lots of uh, webinars on many, many topics. And I, I put some of those on the list, but you can certainly explore around in our YouTube channel. We've got a really nice one on gardening with native plants, learn from our mistakes and our successes, um, really fun. And then if you see here on the sidebar like this, so the playlist is gardening for invertebrates. And some of these will not be so relevant to Indiana, but others like managing the pests in your garden is really nice. It talks about how to design and choose plants and take care of them so that they're healthy to begin with um, and really create a, a strong foundation and diversity so that you've got fewer pest issues to deal with. But then there's some strategies for, for dealing with them if you do get some infestation. Um, Another person in the, the poll talked about powdery mildew on Monarda. I think if you have Monarda in a garden, you've seen powdery mildew on it. Um, they, they just go together. It's not really harmful to the Monarda, so it's more of an aesthetic thing for us. So if you're comfortable with that, you can do nothing and ignore it. Um, if you'd like to try to reduce that, you think it's unsightly, you can just try to give the plant a bit more um, Space and more sun. So just increasing the airflow that way can sometimes help reduce things like powdery mildew. Um, yeah, there's, there's that same managing pests in your garden one. I also um, wanted to mention Bee City USA, which is a program that we have. And it helps towns or cities of any size who really where their leadership or a group of citizens want to make their town more pollinator friendly. They can work to become certified as a, a Bee City USA. It's, it's fairly similar. You might be familiar with Tree City USA, um, but there's a series of, of guidelines and practices that are recommended. And then the town usually drafts a resolution to do, to do that. And it's, it's really exciting. There's so many around the country now, and a lot of them have different festivals that focus on pollinators and native plants, um, you know, all kinds of things celebrating monarchs. And they've also then worked as a community to reduce the, the pesticide use or the impact of pesticides where they live. And I know for some of you, you also mentioned that, you know, in your yard, you wouldn't want to use pesticides or you'd like to manage your yard in a certain way, but your HOA uh, maybe has other rules or requirements. And that, yeah, I've, I've tried to support several groups around the country who are trying to, to deal with that as well. And so we have some, some sample language I'm happy to share if any of you want to get in touch with me about that. But it also, you know, just helps to understand that um, it might be a group effort and, and take some patience and persistence to try to get your HOA to come around or at least make some modifications to that. Um, here's a few books, if you don't know of them yet, that are great for getting started. Butterflies of Indiana, Bumblebees of North America, Tracks and Signs of Insects. And then um, Doug Tallamy, he's got Bringing Nature Home. And just a few years ago, he has another new book called Nature's Best Hope. Those are really great for both I think, explaining the connection between native plants and insects. And also they offer regional plant guide, uh, plant suggestions. These two books are by Heather Holm. She's based in Minnesota, but a lot of you know what she covers is is um, applies to the whole Midwest. The one is more focused on bees, but then it, it goes into great detail about which native plants match with which native bees. And I know she also has um, a new book about wasps coming out this spring. And her website is really nice too. She has several um, free charts that you can download. 
and, and also lists of some of those plants that are good for nesting. So here's an example um, of that, just showing some good native trees and shrubs for pollinators in more detail about um, their characteristics and when they bloom and then which types of, of pollinators are using or feeding on those plants. Here's another list then, um, same, same table, just the shrub section of that. In Xerxes, we have several books as well um, that are more general. Um, these are nationwide. So they've got nice background and kind of foundational information on these topics. And um, we are a donor supported nonprofit. So I would just wanna say thanks to all of our members and welcome any of you to join us. Um, as a member, we have a really nice little um, cute little magazine that goes out twice a year and you get to stay connected and learn all about our programs. And with that, I'm gonna stop the slides. Um, hopefully we have, you know, I'm happy to stick around a bit and talk through things and um, do some more Q and A. And, and there's my email then if you wanna get in touch. Thank you so much. That is some, such great information. And we have had some questions coming in throughout. And so um, why don't I just read them off to you? Um, okay. First, from Ingrid, how, what percent of your yard should approximately be bare soil? And I'd like to add on a question I have related to that. Um, do you think most ground nesting um, bees can get through mulch, like wood chip mulch? I've seen holes in the mulch that- Yeah, yeah. Um, so what percent, you know, it doesn't really need to be that much. Um, I don't know, like a, certainly like under 5%, you know, or even less than that. You just need to have a few areas you probably have them already. I think the idea though is, is just to be aware that there's actually some value in those. You know, don't necessarily try to get something to grow everywhere. Um, if you also don't wanna have to look at bare soil, if you have some shrubs and things, you know, there's like kind of hidden bare soil underneath those shrub canopies and things. So there's ways to incorporate bare soil in without obviously having these bare looking patches. Mulch is a little tricky, um, you know, if you're putting it down to keep weeds managed, then it's probably too thick for, for the bees. Um, so you don't want to like get a case of mulch madness where you've just got inches and inches of it. Um, but again, if you want to use it in most places, but if you have some shrubs, you don't necessarily need to put the mulch all the way under the shrub up to the the stems of the shrub, you can leave some of that bare soil exposed underneath the shrubs. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, somebody asked if you're able to share um, a copy of the PowerPoint. Yeah, um, you've, you've got a copy, Brooke, so. Okay, so just yeah. share that link with folks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. I will put that in the email. Mm -hmm. Tom asks, if you only have one or two of a specific plant, is that enough to help specialist insects that depend on that plant? Um, well, I would just say one or two is better than, than zero. So it, it depends on the context that you're in. If, if you're in um, a fragmented area like a city and you've got a network of in a neighborhood and if each person has a little bit as one or two plants, um, you know, that's making a big difference for that specialist insect. If in that same city, only one person has one or two plants, that, that specialist insect is probably not able to exist in your city. Um, so I don't know, Tom, did I, I'm happy to, to clarify or have you ask again if I didn't quite get what you were asking. Okay, I got a thumbs up. <laughs> okay, yeah, I think I think you did answer it. And you know, okay. the idea of creating corridors and residential neighborhoods by having some here and there um, is mm -hmm. a good take home, I think as well. Yeah. Um, 
Next, somebody, and I'm not sure who asked this one. I've heard that prairie drop seeds fragrance can be unpleasant to some people. Is this a problem with this plant? I haven't heard that. Yeah, it's um, <clears throat> some, to some people it smells like cilantro. And I think some people find that herb unpleasant, whereas other people love it. Other people describe prairie drop seed. It's really, this is a, this is a grass prairie drop seed. Got big clumps of kind of long flowing leaves. And then the seed heads are, are upright and they're like little firecrackers um, with kind of rounded individual seeds in those, those panicles. And as those get ripen, as those ripen, you know, they start out greenish and then they turn to a more light tan color. And that's really where a lot of this fragrance comes from. So I think it's cool. It's a grass that smells, I mean, that's cool. Um, so some people think it smells like cilantro. Others think the fragrance is more like popcorn. Um, to me, it smells like prairie drop seed. <laughs> and and um, I like it. But yeah, if you're concerned, I don't know that I've ever heard that it really causing an allergic reaction or anything. I think it's more just how we perceive um, smells as favorable or unfavorable. And um, you really need a lot of it to kind of get it airborne and really smell it. Otherwise you have to get close to the plant and, and rub it to get that smell. Okay, great. Um, Jenny asked, Stephanie, would you please speak a little more to the effect of controlled burns on beneficial insects. It seems like it's increasing in popularity in establishing or maintaining native prairies, and yet it destroys so many overwintering insects, doesn't it? Yes, that's a, a good question and a good topic to talk about here, because in in prairies, in in some wetland situations, in savannas, there's there's many types of natural communities that are fire dependent, they're adapted to fire. Fire's part of what shapes and maintains those communities. Um, so fire is important to keep a lot of the plants there and those plants are important um, for all the insects and wildlife. So, but at the same time, yeah, fire is, is destructive. And if you're a tiny little insect overwintering in some of that, that leaf litter and it's burned through, you know, it's it's pretty likely that that insect or the insects there are killed. So the kind of good recommendation for folks who are doing prescribed burning, regardless of what size it is, um, is, is you divide it up into different burn units. At a minimum, you, it would be two units. So you divide your area in half. Ideally, you can divide it into thirds or even quarters and you, would never want to burn all of it at once, but instead just burn one half and you leave the other half intact. And then you would alternate. And the next time you burn, burn the half that wasn't burned the first time and leave the half that, that you did burn. So you're getting some rotation in the area that's burned. So fire eventually touches you know, all parts of it and fire is doing that important function of keeping it open, preventing too many trees or shrubs from growing there and shading out um, the prairie plants. Fire's helping cycle nutrients. Fire sometimes also um, spurs plants to flower or to produce more biomass. So there's definitely the regenerative aspect of fire. But yeah, just doing that, that rotation is important and having the mindset that, yeah, if I'm burning this area, I am killing, likely killing any insects there. Um, so don't burn the whole area, but leave areas where some insects will be protected and then they can, you know, recolonize a larger area in the spring. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Becky asks, residential mosquito companies like Mosquito Joe, Mosquito, mosquito Authority, et cetera, are increasing in our community and I want to try and address the issue. Are you aware of any communities or organizations that are specifically addressing this issue of mosquito companies? Um, just off the top of my head, I think Boulder, Colorado is a really nice example. Um, and they're featured as a case study in one of those publications that I linked to. Um, so if you can find that on your own, I would, I would say 
follow the link I sent about mosquito management and you can read about Boulder at that link or you know, independently online, um, look to search for Boulder and mosquito management or something. Okay. Thanks for caring. Thank you for caring about that and trying to change it. Yes. So um, Becky asks also, I have lived and gardened in my area for about 40 years. I am extremely concerned about the huge decline in pollinators, birds, insects of all kinds, etc. Are you aware of efforts currently in place that give you hope that the decline might be turning around? Well, I think just that that statement, you know, gives me gives me hope that I think more and more people are becoming aware of um, well, to use these categories again, insects really are good. They're not bad. Very few of all the insects in the world cause us problems. In fact, we really rely on them um, for so many of the ways that, that nature functions. And I think both the, the pandemic got people to slow down, do a lot more gardening, which I think is, is good for just connecting with nature and connecting about insects, being curious about what's living, you know, in your yard or your town. Um, so from a grassroots perspective, I think I, I do have hope in that I just see the general public becoming more aware and more concerned and more active um, in both native plants and, and pollinator conservation. Um, yeah, there's a lot of challenges out there, those, those big threats of habitat loss, pesticides, um, disease and invasive species, and then, then climate change, you know, those are really big things, but nature is going to keep, keep going on and getting through them, and I think each of us can play a part in trying to sustain that as much as we can in the areas where, where we have that influence, um, you know, by, by trying to reduce pesticides we ourselves might use, encouraging our neighbors, friends, family, co-workers to do that as well, working with our communities to, to reduce what's, what's done in terms of pesticide use. Um, and then also I would say in, in some of our consumer choices, um, Xerces has a, a certification program called Be Better Certified, and, and those are food products that certify that the ingredients have been grown in a way that is bee friendly. Um, it's, it's a very new kind of certification. So there aren't many products that have that yet, but you know, it's another thing you can look for in the label and um, do some of your shopping to support um, conservation that way. Great, that's on the website. Be Better Certified, um, you can find that if you, yeah, it's just Be Better Certified, we'll take you to that. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Mary asks, people kill mantids, is that recommended? Um, people kill mantids, is that recommended? Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm not gonna say like, go kill mantids, but yes, people, people kill them. Um, you know, I, I can understand that, right? There's certainly these voracious predators that are just eating kind of whatever they can, can grab and they can even sometimes catch hummingbirds or frogs. They can eat things much, much bigger than they are. Um, and um, yeah, you're, you're kind of in control of your little yard or your area. And I think you've got to look at like what your goals are, right? If you really want to have mantises and watch them eat things, then don't kill them, <laughs> let them do that. But if you want to have, if you really see that you've got a big um, mantis population and you want there to be opportunity for many more other insects to live there, then that might be a case where you choose to, to kill the mantises. I don't know, I feel like Sometimes when I'm out in prairies and things, there's just so many of them everywhere that it's just kind of pointless. You know, I might kill a few, but um, is it really going to make a difference? Probably not. Um, Lori's asking right now, but what eats the mantis? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Or I, I don't actually know if, um, if there are any 
birds or, you know, some of our nocturnal mammals like possums and raccoons, they're actually eating a lot of insects. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't actually know like what is kind of keeping mantises in check. Mm -hmm. I have a quick question for you. I see that bug crawling on your uh, monitor in front of you. Is that, is that just like commonplace? <laughs> right here. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> they're all, um, I tolerate, you know, a lot of insects in my life. And so, so yeah, this is Harmonia. This is the, the Asian um, lady beetle. It was what was on my actual computer screen as I was working today. And that was, you know, in the comment as well. I'm, I'm like right up against a Western facing wall here. Um, so I think, you know, this time of year, they are in cavity mm -hmm. in the wall and they should really just be resting and overwintering, but both the warmth of, of the inside of my house. And then when the sun shines on that Western wall, um, that activates them and they find their way in here where it's warm. Yeah. Okay. They're like, yeah, I, I vacuum them, vacuum them. I don't actually kill them too much because there's just so many of them, it seems pointless. And um, they, they die, you know, within a few days, it seems I vacuum almost every day. And there's another round of dead ones there. <laughs> um, but yeah. Okay, fair enough. I was just curious. Okay, so yeah. up here, yeah. <laughs> Mary asked another question. No, she's not asking questions. She's making a statement. She said they have no Japanese beetles after we planted for biodiversity with lots of different plants. Wonderful. So that was yeah. her experience. Mm -hmm. um, Tom has a follow up to um, his question about plants for specialists. I might need him to call. Maybe you can understand this better. Is it better with a large native garden to have many plants or to have more of a smaller number? Mm, okay. Mm -hmm. um, I think for, I guess, saying large native garden would be yard sized, um, or, you know, or garden that fits within a yard. I think there it would be to have greater, more species. Um, so fewer numbers of individual species, but greater diversity of species there. Um, I, that's a question that comes up more with uh, planning habitat that's acres and acres in size. And, and for something like the monarch, where they're flying big distances and they might be flying sort of at a high, higher height. And for them to come in and find where milkweed is, that milkweed is, is more concentrated. You know, there's sort of like a really dense area of milkweeds that could make it easier um, for monarchs or I think what Tom's asking you know for specialist bees to find those those flowers that's certainly true monarchs of course are flying hundreds if not thousands of miles some of them whereas all of these specialist bees most of them are pretty tiny and again they're really tied to their nest sites and they have very um, tight radius or um, areas that they'll be foraging in. So, you know, less than a, a quarter mile. So again, if you've got um, bees really need a diversity of plants in their immediate area, um, or otherwise they just can't get to them. So yeah, for um, a native garden, if you want to go for conservation value, the, the more different species is um, a little bit better than just greater quantities of fewer species. Okay, great, thanks. Mm -hmm. I have a quick follow-up question to that. Is there a certain certain percentage um, that you recommend having for native grasses of your planting? Is there a certain percentage that should be dedicated to grasses? Um, you know, in, in a garden setting, maybe something like 10 or 20%. Can, it can be less, it can be more, depending on, on what you like aesthetically. For folks who are, are doing native plantings by seed, so these might be you know, many acres or hundreds of acres in size, um, it, it starts to become both a budgetary question as well as, as a plant diversity question. Um, and there, it also depends, you know, you may have something from 40, 70% of, of the seeds might be grasses in a mix like that. Okay, great.
Great. You know, it also depends if, if you're going to be managing it with fire. You know, we talked about the pros and cons of fire. Mm -hmm. So if your native garden is one that you burn, grasses, like actually um, the litter, the, the types of, of leaf litter that grasses have, that's much more persistent. You know, it doesn't degrade or decompose as quickly as a lot of the forbs. And so for that reason, it's a good fuel. It helps carry fire throughout an area. So um, incorporating grasses is important for that. We've also talked about why grasses are important for pollinators. Um, and it's also, you know, if you're looking at prairie plants, in, in the prairie, there would be a lot of grass in there. And that's just part of the matrix or the structure that helps, that everybody holds, holds up and stands up with our grasses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's how you keep those tall plants standing up, huh? Yeah, give them a grass neighbor. Okay, great. Um, I have one more question on the list. And so if anybody has any more questions to enter in the chat, go ahead and do that now. And um, Mickey, we might need a little, this is from Mickey Penrod. She's asking endangered list for Monarch. What's next? Mm, uh -huh. So she's asking, um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has been um, evaluating a petition to consider whether or not the monarch butterfly should be listed as a federally endangered species. All right. was several years in the works. Mm -hmm. um, and Xerces was, was the organization that led that um, petition. Yeah. So um, the decision came out in December. And it was it was kind of like a, a slightly it wasn't clear <laughs> indefinite decision. Uh -huh. It was neither yes or no. It it basically said yes, protecting the monarch butterfly is warranted, but precluded. That's the the technical legal language. So you can Google warranted but precluded if you want to read more about that. Okay. But but basically, it doesn't. It, it puts the monarch as a candidate species. So it's okay. like a little bit higher up, um, you know, into the, the chain of, of protection towards becoming an actual endangered species, okay. but okay. it's kind of on the slow track to be there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And, then and you've got, you know, we're in the, we're east of the Rockies here in Indiana. And, and so our monarch population is the Eastern population. There's a separate Western monarch population kind of divided by the Rocky Mountains. And that Western population is really just in, in dire decline right now. So um, we'll see, it seems like the Eastern population is, is not that terrible. Um, at least in, in recent years, the population counts have been okay, but you know, not great. But yeah, there's also sort of that division between what are the issues with the Western population and what does it need to recover versus different situation with the Eastern population. So uh, Tom, does that answer your question? Tom asks, are monarch, monarch populations improving? So with all of the, the rise in conservation efforts, Tom says yes, that you answered his question. Okay. Okay, and then um, Sarah asks, do you know if you can plant natives on septic fields? Sure, you can plant natives on um, septic fields. You know, it depends if, I don't know exactly how all septic fields are designed, but some of the natives with deeper roots, you don't want them to, to be able to penetrate. Um, you know, if there's actually any pipes or, or drainage structure in there. But um, yeah, there's no reason, you know, the plants will do fine. Um, it's, it's another question of just knowing what the soil is like in terms of texture, um, how much moisture is there, how much sun or shade, and then matching the plants uh, from a, a plant list or based on those characteristics. There's not really any, um, any additional considerations for receptive field other than that, that one question about roots. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you everybody here for submitting those questions. Those were some really great questions. I appreciate it. Um, it looks like we've covered all of those questions and we have kept you over time, Stephanie.
but this has been just such a, a wealth of knowledge and such a great presentation. I really appreciate your being here. And um, we will figure out how to get the recording out to the registrants for the, for the presentation. Um, folks uh, have Stephanie's email in the chat and um, I will be sending out the, um, I'll be sending out the resource list that she put together. So Ingrid is trying to get one last question in here. Can you take one more okay. question, Stephanie? Yeah, yeah, I'd love okay. to. Ingrid asks, I have heard that overwintering sites in Mexico are threatened due to logging. How can we help Mexico? We do our part here in North America, but without the sites in Mexico, it does not matter. That, that's true too. Like I said, we are all in this together on this planet. And you know, we have this, um, these two countries with this shared monarch population and the US and a little bit of Canada is the, the breeding area and Mexico is where the overwintering area is. So all those um, pieces of its habitat need to be healthy for the species to do well. Um, yeah, there's again, I think some different transnational partnerships that have tried to address this. There's several monarch conservation groups that work in Mexico um, to protect it. Those groves of trees are um, a sanctuary and there's also a buffer zone around that, but, but there is a legal activity that happens there. Um, also, you may have heard in the, the past year, several Mexican monarch conservationists were murdered. Um, so, you know, there's kind of that, that political part of it as well. Um, so I think I, I may have some information. Yeah, I'm not having a good answer about that, unfortunately. Um, I, I did just see some news today about another update about some of the work in Mexico. So I'd like to track that down and I can share that to Brooke also. Great. Thanks, Stephanie. Appreciate that. Well, if there are no other questions, then um, we'll go ahead and end the meeting. And again, Stephanie, thank you so much for taking the time. We really appreciate it. And thank you for all the great work that you're doing. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you for the invitation. And again, I, you know, I'd like it if we could have a little bit more interaction here, but, but with the technology and the size that we are, it's, it's not always so easy. So Thank you all for your attention and for doing what you're doing um, and for your great questions and, and sharing your experiences. Good night, everybody. Hopefully we'll see you next time.